It's uh, great to be with you this weekend, and what a gorgeous weather weekend. We only get 28 days here in Wisconsin, so uh, you decided to come to church, and it's so great to see so many of you here in the room. I'm really excited about what God is doing, and if you're a family, just want to remind you that we are going back to our two-service rotation September 12th, and so excited to see what God is not only going to do in the fall, but what he wants to do this weekend. Well, you know, speaking of kids, a couple weeks ago, they did a superhero Sunday. So if you were there in late June, they were running through the lobby with all of their costumes on. And you know what? Here's the question. Let me ask you this question. If you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? Okay. (laughs) Maybe it would be to make loud noises randomly. I don't know. If you were a superhero, though, uh, what ability would you love to possess? I mean, would you like to be invisible or perhaps you'd like to be able to fly like Superman, right? I don't know what it would be, but last week we were having some fun with our staff and one staff member said this. They said, you know, I would love to be able to instantly teleport to any place here on earth. Wouldn't that be cool, right? To be able to teleport. Now, let me take a different angle on that question. What if you were able to have a spiritual superpower? What would that be? Strength? Strength, say like like Samson, or wisdom, say like maybe Solomon, or what about prayer? Perhaps you would love to have the spiritual superpower to be able to have all your prayers Answered. Wouldn't that be amazing and impressive, right? If you, everybody's hand is kind of shooting. Yeah, I would love to have that. Well, uh, today we're in part two of a series called Off the Grid. And last week, uh, Dre kicked us off by talking about this critical element of rest. We're examining three critical elements that will help us grow our faith in God. So last week we talked about rest. This week I want to focus in on the topic of prayer. Now, In the Old Testament, there was a prophet, one of the greatest men of of all scripture. His name is Elijah. And when you read his most famous story, you would think that he possessed this this spiritual superpower of prayer. I mean, incredible power of prayer. But before I tell you the most famous story in his life and ministry, I want to set context and I want to give you a little bit of the biblical background. See, when Elijah was alive, he lived during the time period when the northern kingdom of Israel had just experienced 19 consecutive evil kings spanning over 200 years. Let that sink in for a moment. 200 years of 19 consecutive bad kings. I mean, obviously our country is older than 200 years and we live in a democracy where if we have a president, uh, we would have to endure at max eight years of an ineffective leader, right? But here in Israel during Elijah's time period, 19 consecutive spanning 200 years of not only ineffective leaders, but also evil leaders. So much so that during the time of his, Elijah's most famous prayer and and the time in which the most famous story of his life and ministry takes place, there's an evil king, a guy by the name of Ahab. Everybody say Ahab. Ahab. Now, I say Ahab because you're going to know his wife. Uh, Whether you're a a person of faith or not, you've probably heard her name in pop culture. Her name is Jezebel. Ever hear of Jezebel, right? Jezebel was a wicked lady. In fact, uh, some would say the most wicked woman that ever was on the face of the earth. And Ahab, uh, Scripture says that he did more evil in the eyes of God than any of those 19 kings. Here's what was taking place during those times. Those kings, especially Ahab, would turn the hearts of the people away from the one true God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to the gods, the false gods of Baal and Asherah. And this took time, you have to understand that this story took time during a place, uh, took time Uh, uh, took took place during the time of a three and a half year drought. There was no rain. 
And so the false prophets, the prophets of the false gods of Baal and Asherah said, if you follow Baal, if you follow Asherah, here's what's gonna take place. They're gonna make it rain on the land. Therefore, in turn, you're gonna have food for you and your families, and this will lead you to a better life. But how many of you know that that false gods promise only what the true God provides. Isn't that true? Isn't that right? Well, that's the context. Let me tell you the most famous story that's recorded in 1 Kings 18. Here's what takes place. See, God didn't just raise up an army against Ahab. God does what he usually does, and he raises up one person. It's like, the girl, the teenage girl who stands up for purity among all of her friends, or a young business leader who stands up for integrity in a business that's lacking integrity. It's like someone who gets into politics to stand for truth in a world that's crumbling. God typically uses one person to make a big difference. Are you that person? Are you that person? See, God used Elijah because in 1 Kings chapter 18, he confronts Ahab and he throws down a challenge and he says this to Ahab. He said, you know what? Here's what I'd like to propose. I'd like to propose this little challenge. Two altars, two bulls, and let's call on God. And whoever God, like, whosoever God shows up and fire falls and takes the sacrifice, then we'll know that that God is the real God. And Elijah says, oh, by the way, how about we call all of the nation of Israel, all the people up to the top of Mount Carmel? So all the people come up in 1 Kings 18, they're on the mountain, and, and Elijah addresses them. He says this, hey, stop wavering between two opinions. If God is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. So we're gonna have a little contest, he says. He says, we're gonna set up these altars and we're gonna have all of these false prophets. In fact, uh, uh, what takes place is that Ahab has 450 prophets, Baal prophets, and then 400 prophets of Asherah, and they have this contest. Elijah says, why don't you go first? So they set up the altar, they kill the bull, they put the pieces on the altar, and scripture says, from morning to noon, that's a long prayer session, friends, like four hours, these 850 prophets are praying and praying and praying and praying. And there is zero response. God, God, their God, Baal and Asherah, they're not replying. So much so that the people are bored. So they pull out their iPhones and they're on TikTok. <laughs> and since Elijah didn't get his new iPhone 12, he's like, well, he begins, scripture says, he begins to to smack talk them. Now that's not the technical term. He says, he taunts them. He taunts the prophets and he says, hey, where's your God? Is he like preoccupied? Is he sleeping? Is he, is he tired? And then all the people are taking like, like photos of, of Elijah, like hashtag taunting. You know, like, whoa, this is crazy, right? And so then it gets really wild because the prophets begin to cut themselves and they're dancing around the altar and the people are like, this is insane. So Elijah comes up next and he takes the altar, he builds the altar and he puts the bull on top, kills the bull, cuts it up, puts it on top. And then he does something pretty amazing. He begins to dig a trench around the entire altar and he says to the people, why don't you find a couple large jars and I want you to fill them with water. He proceeds to tell them, take those jars and I want you to pour it on top of the altar. Not once, not once friends, not twice, but three times he does this. So in front of a dripping wet sacrifice with 850 false prophets and all of the people of Israel on top of Mount Carmel, Elijah steps up and he prays one two-sentence prayer. You can read about it in verses 36 and 37. One two-sentence prayer. And fire falls from heaven. Like, whoo. The people drop their phones. 
whoa. Scripture says, not only burns up the sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the soil, but licks up the water around the altar. Friends, that's a wow. That's a wow. Can you imagine being on top of the mountain watching this one prophet standing in front of all these people and praying this prayer? You would think that he had like a spiritual superpower, like he has the market on how to pray to God. You would think, wow, that is so cool. That would be pretty amazing. Like I would have loved to been there to watch that take place. Place. It, it makes me think of a verse over in the New Testament book of James. He writes this. He says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and say that word, effective. effective. Wasn't Elijah's prayer effective? One two-sentence prayer. Fire fell. God answered. God answered. Now, when you think about Elijah's life, if you were just to read that story in isolation, you would think to yourself, wow. And then there would be this tension. If you're like, like me, there'd be a problem because my experience is that God doesn't typically answer my prayers that way. D does he answer your prayers that way? Probably not. We're honest, we've had a couple times in life where God just answered a prayer and it was something supernatural and miraculous. And I'm thankful. The good news is this. The very next verse in the book of James says this, that Elijah was a human being as we are. Elijah is a human being just like we are. Now, if you just stop with the one story that I told you, you would think to yourself, really? Elijah doesn't seem like a human. He seems like a superhero, like a superhuman being. Unless I tell you the very next story in 1 Kings 18, then you'll see how his effective prayer life is far more relatable to you and to me. So let's look together. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41 says this. And Elijah said to Ahab, the wicked king, go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. He bent down to the ground and he put his face between his knees. So Elijah is praying for rain. There's the sound of rain, but it's not yet come in. So, so, so Elijah is praying. Verse 43 says this. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and he looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. And at the seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So, Here's what you need to know. Many of us, we struggle in our personal prayer life. We struggle. Consistency is tough. Authenticity can be hard at times to be just very open and transparent with God, with what we're thinking and how we're truly feeling. I mean, for some of us who've been believers for a while, we know all the, the sayings and, and the words to say, but sometimes our heart is not there. If you're new in faith, you hear people like that praying, you're like, oh man, that... We, we struggle because at times we don't feel like God is answering our prayers, that he's distant, that he's, he's not working. And so we get to this place where we think, man, it's like prayer, is this, is this effective? Like, I don't know what, what, what to do. But today, if you would listen with me, here's what I believe. If you would engage in God's word together, I believe that what God is going to do is he's going to open our hearts and he's going to deposit something inside of us that has the potential to transform our prayer lives. That we're gonna walk away not the same person because we're gonna have a new perspective on prayer and it's not going to be a superhero or superhuman perspective. It's going to be a real life perspective. So here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna extract four nuggets 
nuggets of truth, four nuggets of truth. You know, like when you bring groceries home to your kids and all of a sudden they extract all the snacks and they're like, where are all the, where are all the chips? They're gone, your kids got them, okay? <laughs> We're going to extract four nuggets of truth. I wanna give you four qualities of effective prayer, four qualities of effective prayer. And here's what I, I want you to do. As we look at Elijah's prayer, the verses that I just read to you, we're gonna find that this prayer was just as effective as the prayer when the fire fell, but it's far more relatable to you and me. So if you're taking notes, why don't you jot this down? Here's the first quality. Effective prayers are humble prayers. Effective prayers are humble prayers. See, Elijah went up to the top of the mountain. After the fire fell, he came down. They killed all those false prophets. And then he says to Ahab, go and eat and drink. And then he goes back up to the top of the mountain. Puts his North Face gear on. He gets all ready to go. He has his GPS out. He wants to get back up there again. And he falls on the ground. You know what he's doing? He's getting off the grid. He's getting off the grid. Why? Because he needed to be alone with God. Sometimes we need to get off the grid to be alone with God. Sometimes we need to climb a mountain. Sometimes we need to go for a long bike ride or a car ride. Sometimes we have to go off into the woods. We need to get alone because growth is a choice. And if you want to grow in your faith, then you need to be intentional about getting away and breaking the rhythm of busyness. Amen? Amen. And so that's what Elijah does. He goes up to the top of the mountain. Now, now listen to what takes place next. Here's what it says. It says, he bent down to the ground and he put his face between his knees. He goes up to the top of the mountain and I don't think he's tired because I think he's already been to the top. Of, I think he understands like, yeah, I, I know what I'm doing. And he, he bends down and he sits on the ground and he puts his face between his knees. You know what he's doing? He's humbling himself. Elijah's humbled in that moment. That's a picture of what is going on spiritually inside of Elijah. In other words, prayer is not only a way to communicate with God. Prayer is a way to commune with God. See, what Elijah is saying, God, you are holy. God, God, I need you. I am praying for rain. He is spiritually humbling himself by placing his face between his knees. He's not embarrassed. He's, he's not ashamed. He just understands who he is in, in front of God. And he says, God, God, I, I'm a nobody. I'm small. I'm tiny. I know you love me. And I know you heard my prayer before when the fire fell. But right now I feel tiny and incapable. I can't make it rain, God. I can't make it rain. I need you. Because God, you're a big God. And God, I know you here. And God, you're the creator. And God, you're the sustainer. And God, you're the provider. And all of a sudden, his faith begins to rise because he knows he, he cannot produce the rain, but he knows who can bring the rain. He humbled himself. Great verse on humility. If you're taking notes, you want to take a, a screenshot. Here's what a verse on humility says, I love this, that God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. What does God show to the humble? Favor. See, friends, humility oftentimes precedes the miraculous in our life. When we're humble, that gives opportunity for God to show up and do the miraculous. Because when we're prideful, we think then that miracle is produced by us versus God. And I think this is especially important when it comes to effective prayer life because God already did the miraculous on the top of Mount Carmel earlier in chapter 18 when he prayed one two-sentence prayer. But now Elijah and his prayer life is demonstrating something else to you and me because this story that I just read to you doesn't get a lot of airtime. You don't hear a lot of preachers preaching on this. But it's so relatable because it's so easy for us to forget that we're not doing the miracles. God is doing the miracles. And so we need to stay humble. 
We need, if you want God's attention, if you want God to, to hear the prayer that you're bringing him, learn how to humble yourself before a holy God. The second quality of effective prayer is this. Effective prayers are specific prayers. Effective prayers are specific prayers. You know, it's so easy. It's so easy just to pray generic prayers. You know, you wake up and uh, God, uh, protect. God, protect my family today. God, give me, you know, help me with today. Give me strength. You know what I got to face. And, and listen, generic prayers are great prayers. But specific prayers bring a new level of effectiveness, and here's why. Number one, when we pray specific prayers, we see the answers to those prayers, how God is leading. Whether it's a yes or a no, or just hold on that. We get a sense of that, and that gives us clearer direction. And number two, when he does answer us, do you know what it does? It does, it boosts our confidence such that we're, we're able to bring more questions and more requests and lay more decisions and lay them at his feet because we know that he is a God who is listening and he answers our prayer. Now, this prayer session that Elijah is on is far different than the one before. Remember, all the people are there, 850 prophets. This time, it's him and his servant. And he prays the prayer, God, would you send rain? God, would you send rain? Let's look at what happens next. Verse 43, he says, Go and look toward the sea, he told the servant. Now, he says go, because typically he would send him off to the Mediterranean. That's where a, a, a storm would, would, would come up. So he prayed this specific prayer. He wanted to see what God was doing. What, what, what was he up to? What was God doing? You know, we have to pray specific prayers to see what God is doing. See what he is up to. God, I want to bring this before you. Elijah needed rain. What do you need? What kind of outpouring do you need? What kind of heaven down? What kind of answer? What, what are you asking God for? Are your prayers specific? That is so powerful. It's one of the, the qualities of effective prayer. And that's what Elijah modeled to all of us. It was specific in his prayer. So, here's the third quality of effective prayer. Effective prayers are persistent prayers. So, he goes on top of the mountain, and he's humbled himself before God. He has prayed a very specific prayer, and here's the third quality. He's persistent in his prayer. Let's see where his persistence is found. Look at the last half of verse 43. When he went up, he looked. There is nothing there, the servant reported to Elijah. So, here's what Elijah said. Seven times. How many times? Seven. Seven. Seven times Elijah said, go back. Man, that servant must have been in pretty good shape. Like, really? Yeah, run down the mountain again, go check it out, go back up, go back. I mean, this guy, he was an ultra marathoner. Yeah. Okay. Seven times. I think I, I might have said, hey, you're going to have to find another servant after three. He's persistent. What, what, did, what did Elijah do? Elijah. Prayed and he 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 prayed, didn't he? He prayed for rain. His prayer was persistent. Come back. No, it's not there. Come back. And what did he do? He prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. It didn't appear that God was working. What did he do? He prayed and 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 he prayed. God, God, you're he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Here's what I love about this third quality. Listen, everybody lean in for a second. Persistence is so important because a persistent prayer life, listen, listen, an effective prayer life is forged in a persistent prayer life. And here's what I love about Elijah's story. He did not allow the outward circumstances of what was going on to, to impact, to affect his inward assurance. Let me say that again. He didn't allow the outward to affect his inward assurance. He knew that God was listening. He knew that he was called to pray for rain. He knew that what he was going to do until God was going to send rain, he was going to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. Let me ask you a question. What have you quit praying for that you need to begin to pray for again? You've stopped praying for a marriage that has drifted. 
Oh, we've been doing this for 10 or 15 years. I guess this is the way it's just going to be. You need to start praying for that again. You need to pray for a job that perhaps, you know, ah, oh, I guess I'm stuck. You need to be praying that God would unstick you. That God would provide and give. Maybe it's a financial crisis. I don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit knows. He's speaking to some of you. Some of you right now are watching online and you know you need to persist in prayer. You know that the equality, the effectiveness of your prayer life is going to be forged in persistence. And that's exactly what Elijah does. He is so persistent to the point where he receives an answer. But the answer is far different that when the fire fell, that's what's so incredible. Here's the fourth quality of effective prayers. Effective prayers are expectant prayers. Everybody say expectant. They're expectant. There's a level of expectation. Let's look together in verse 44. Here's what takes place. The seventh time the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand. All the men in the room, how about you just take and put your hand just like this. If you're sitting with somebody, I want you to show your girlfriend, your spouse, your, 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 your sister-in-law, your kids. I just want you to look down the row and just show them your hand. Show them your hand. Just go ahead. Do it right now, all across the room. If you're at home, go like this. Go ahead. Just show them. If you're, if you're on the treadmill, if you're, if you're exercising, show somebody your hand. If you're a guy, okay? Show them your hand, okay? All right. As small as a man's hand, it's rising from the sea. Now notice what his servant did not say. Elijah, a monsoon is brewing in the Mediterranean, baby. There's going to be rain. It's coming. Everybody goes, woo, yeah. Mm -mm. No. Small as a man's hand. It's barely cresting the Mediterranean. Now, I don't know about you, but if I prayed and 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 prayed, and that's what I got after seven times, my servant's ready to quit on me. I'm ready to pack it in. Like, okay, God, I guess you did the big thing with the fire, but the rain's not working. I'm good with fire, not rain. Good with fire, not water. I'm a fire guy. You need fire, I'll pray for fire. Water, not so much my specialty. But that's not what Elijah did. You know what Elijah did? Listen to this. I love this. This is going to blow your stinking mind. This encouraged me this week. He said, go and tell Ahab, hitch your, your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Not before the rain starts, before it stops you. He is so expectant. He said, sound the emergency plan. The storm is coming. The rain is coming. God is going to move. We've been praying. He's shaking his servant. Go tell Ahab his servant like, oh my word, you got a five hour energy drink right now. Say, I don't really care. Go run down one more time. There's some of you have been humbling yourself and, and, and you've been praying specific prayers and persistent. Listen, expectation is the next step in your prayer life because when God begins to move in some small ways, if you continue to press in, you'll see him to start to move in some ways and the rain will come. God will do some amazing things. And here's what's pretty amazing. Um, Meanwhile, see, God meets our expectation with miracles. The sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, and a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. I wonder if the clouds would have formed if Elijah would have given up and said, ah, it's just a small hand, it's nothing. In fact, I wonder if, I don't know, maybe, Maybe the reason that he could stand in front of all the people and all the false prophet and pray one, two sentence prayer and have that much faith is because he had prayed all those hidden prayers. <laughs> those effective prayers that nobody really knew about. But God did. God moved. I wonder if our if our private life, our private prayer life, impacts our public life for Jesus. 
Sometimes we get so involved in what God is gonna do in public and we forget, first of all, God needs to do something in us privately. He's gotta move us. He's gotta move us. See, for some of you this weekend, summer provides the opportunity to break off and to go off the grid a bit, slows down, perhaps you need to devote You need to isolate on one of these qualities and you say, God, I I need to persist. I need to get a little bit more specific. God, I gotta humble myself. I've been prideful in this last season. Uh, And I I gotta put my face between my knees. Say, God, you are God and I am not. For, For some of you, you just need to go off the grid to break the rhythm of busy. You need to get intentional. You need to grow in God and And for some of you, you're here today and you need to begin your journey. You need to begin that growth process. Maybe you're watching online, you're listening to this, you're in this room and you've never began a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Growth is a choice and today I wanna give you a choice. I wanna extend an invitation to you. I want you to know who Jesus is. Jesus is God's one and only son. The Bible says that God loved us so much that he sent Jesus out of heaven. You know what Jesus did? He went off the grid for you and me. He gave up the splendor of heaven and he stepped out of heaven and he said, I'm gonna become in flesh form a human being. Why? To save all of us because the father loved us so much. He loves you, that's why he brought you here today. He wants you to know that he loves you. And if you're here today and you want to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. But let me be very clear about who Jesus is. Jesus is the sinless son of God and he paid the perfect price on the cross. We celebrated earlier in communion. It was through his blood, broken body for you, for me. And you have never placed your faith in Jesus or You've drifted. Today's your day. This is your moment. If you sense it inside of you, if you're online, here's what I want you to do. Just type in, I'm giving my life to Jesus. One of our team members will reach out to you, help you, get you resources that you need. But if you're here today, this is a Christian community. We're the body of Christ. If you're here today and you need to make a decision for Jesus Christ, then I want you just to go ahead and lift up your hand because I want to acknowledge your decision today. You're here today and you need to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Who would that be? Anyone? Today? A decision for Jesus Christ. Growth is a choice. Okay. We don't know who is making decisions online today. And maybe I missed your hand. Or maybe you're just making a decision in your heart. But let's go ahead and let's pray together out loud. Father, thank you for loving me, for sending your son Jesus Christ to die for me. Jesus saved me. I repent of my sin. I invite you into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I might follow you. Now, Father, I pray for our congregation, God, for every single person who's watching and listening and worshiping you, that you would tenderize their heart. God, all of us, I think it's safe to say that all of us want to grow in our communication, our communion with you through prayer, this element. God, I pray that you would speak to us. God, that you would, you would shape us. God, I pray that today, you know, you know exactly how you want it to, to present this word. It went out. Now, Holy Spirit, you do your thing. Let it fall on good soil, good root, God. I pray that it would take root and grow, 30, 60, 90, God, hundredfold. God, let it grow in the hearts of our people. We love you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would hear and answer our prayer. Do exceedingly abundantly more than we can even ask or think. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the matchless name of Jesus. And everyone who agreed with this prayer said, amen, amen. Hey, can we do this by faith? Can we just celebrate those who came in to faith today and made a decision for Jesus Christ?